Hey everybody, I'm Martin, that's David, and this is the Atheist Experience. Welcome back to another Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much for tuning in. We're always happy to uh, you know, have our really great uh, group of regular viewers showing up, 4.30, to watch us. This show is sponsored by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. ACA holds weekly meetings every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., at uh, Hot Jumbo Bagels, which is at 307 West 5th Street, uh, between Guadalupe and Lavaca, downtown on 5th Street. It's about a block west from Antone's. Except for the very first Sunday of each month, when we have our lecture series in the Longhorn Room at First Cafeteria in North Cross Mall. Uh, our next lecture will be next Sunday, as it will be the uh, first Sunday of March. And I do not know if we... Do we even have a speaker lined up? Does anybody? Manda. Manda. So. We think Manda. Maybe Amanda will call today and confirm that for us. <laughs> that would be nice. But anyway, uh, that starts at 11 o'clock. You know, we have a brunch, and then, and then it's a, um, I have a ladybug on my thing. Check him out. <laughs> I don't know where he came from. I'm sorry, folks. We're having nature. This is nature day. <laughs> Evolution before your eyes. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, godless gamers meet uh, every Monday night at the home of Jeff D. and Amanda. Uh, for more information on Godless Gamers, how to get their directions, you may, uh, and off he goes. <laughs> and don't go to the light, no. <laughs> Move towards the light, no. They'll come back. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This is the wildest thing, a little ladybug. Um, anyway, uh, atheist-gamers mailing list is uh, accessible via our website at atheist-community.org, and you can probably go on there and get to directions uh, from an archived post. Um, I, my equilibrium has been thrown off by our it's little lady six-legged, six-legged friend. Yeah, um, ACA Happy Hour it takes place Wednesday evenings about 7.30 p.m. at Antonio's Tex-Mex, which is near the intersection of I-35 and 183, Highway 183, and that's a fun little evening, midweek get-together for you know folks who find it hard to make it to the Sunday morning stuff. Um, all right, for more information on Atheist Community of Austin, you can visit our lovely website at Atheist community.org or call our voicemail at 371-2911. The Nonprofits is a weekly internet radio show hosted by Jeff D and featuring Vic Farrow and Mary McManamy, which uh, plays on the internet every Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock p.m. p.m. at the atheistnetwork.com website, and your web browser will need the Real Player plugin in order to hear the audio stream, and you can interact with the show through the uh, live chat room feature that's... Um, that's right there, at atheistnetwork.com. And so let me see, uh, any further announcements? Uh, nothing that I know of going on uh, in the near future, although 1st of March is coming up, and ACA members know, know what that means. Um, and let's see, above and beyond that? No, I think we're covered. So, David, what's okay. happening in the world? Let's go to the we news. Have lots of stuff in the news going on. Uh, let's start, I think, <clears throat> with Attorney General John D. Ashcroft. Ah, yeah. So your favorite guy. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite people. Of mine, yeah. Yesterday, well, of course, this was, when did I get this? February 19th. So February 18th, apparently. Uh, Attorney General John D. Ashcroft yesterday cast the government's war on terrorism in religious terms. Ah. Surprise. Mm -hmm. Arguing that the campaign... Well, this is the guy who, like, uh, makes all of his employees engage in prayer with him at the beginning of each workday, right? Well, or maybe he doesn't make them do it. He doesn't make it. them, but they are okay. allowed... They, <clears throat> they, it's voluntary. They can come in and have a... Of course, those that don't are, you know... Yeah, are, are made to feel uncomfortable. They get, and, they get the coffee and you yeah, know, so on. Right. Uh, anyway. Uh, he uh, cast <laughs> the government's war on terrorism in religious terms arguing that the campaign is rooted in faith in God and urging Christians, Jews, and Muslims to unite in the effort. Contrasting the way of God and the way of the terrorists, Ashcroft's speech to a group of Christian broadcasters in Nashville included some of the most explicitly religious remarks from the Attorney General since he was confirmed amid controversy more than a year ago. Uh, according to Ashcroft, civilized people, Muslims, Christians, and Jews... <laughs> All understand that the source of freedom and human dignity is the Creator. Now, I wonder. Now, I, I, I like to point out. I like to reiterate a point that was made on the ACA mailing list, which is, okay, the, at least under the um, teachings of Christianity, right? Okay, this, the God of Christianity demands worship. Yes. And demands your pretty much unconditional, you know, devotion. Yes. Okay, and if you don't give him this. Yeah, he throws you into this a horrible place called hell where, you know, tiny demons poke you in the butt for eternity with, you know, flaming tweezers, right? Mm, I and think so. various other amusing punishments. 
And and we're and I'm supposed to agree that this is the source. This kind of being is the source of my dignity and your freedom and my freedom. Source of freedom and dignity. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, Gee, that's it's kind a, of a puzzler. It's a fascinating I, twist on it. Yeah, it's a weird little paradox. Um, I I wonder, you know. Hmm. Well, he also said that quote: "We are a nation called to defend freedom, a freedom that is not the grant of any government or document, but is our endowment from God." So uh, I would really <laughs> like John Ash. Could someone send John Ashcroft a copy of this document because maybe he heard about it at one point in junior high civics class, but he hasn't covered it since then. Let's just uh, get a close up of this. I really, really like jo- uh, John Ashcroft's opinion on this document. OK, you see the t- this top part here. We the people. All right. That's where everything that's where everything comes from in our in our nation. This is where our laws and our freedoms. OK. This is a government by the people, for the people, you know, and of the people. Well, that's although right. not in that order, it's uh, that's right. It was founded on reason and freedom. That's right. It is not n- on a king, okay. earthly, or spiritual. This is not a theistic document in any way, shape, or form. Okay, and we are forever getting Christians calling us up trying to tell us that it is, da da da, and then we whip it out and read to them from it, and you know, it is only, and it is only in, under a secular government that people can have these various religious freedoms yep. that they seem to think they're being denied by, by virtue of the fact that this isn't some theocracy. Well, we have another thing. Uh, apparently in an interview with Cal Thomas, who is, a, of course, a conservative writer, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. a little opinion maker, mm-hmm. uh, Cal Thomas quoted Ashcroft as saying that, quote, Islam is a religion in which God requires you to send your son to die for him, Christianity is a faith in which God sends his son to die for you. So obviously this has a bunch of people, you know, uh, (laughs) the Islam religion, you know, pretty upset Mm -hmm. about that. But uh, something that I noticed is very interesting. He says Islam is a religion. Christianity is a faith. Now, to a lot of fundamentalist Christians, that's an important little point because they're always saying, oh, I'm not religious. I have a personal you know, relationship with Jesus Christ. They like to play the uh, definitions so game. I think yeah. by saying Islam is a religion and then pointing out that Christianity is a faith, that it's a subtle slam. Well, yeah, they're uh, trying to that, say uh, that our way is better. Yes. It's better to be a Christian than it is to be a Muslim. However, Ashcroft said in a statement last week that the reported remarks do not accurately reflect what I believe I said. <laughs> now, Cal Thomas said, that's what he said. I wrote it down. I repeated uh-huh. it back to him. That's what he said. So you have here, I'm pretty certain, you've got Ashcroft, the champion of morality and righteousness and religion, lying. Now, well, he also said... Well, do you expect any sort of a tolerant, very, you know, humane statement coming from a guy who would, like, agree to give an address at Bob Jones University? Yes. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, 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 get a, talking uh, about our, uh, our little war on terrorism, he also said, this is not a conflict based in religion. It is a conflict between good and evil, and as President Bush has reminded us, we know that God is not neutral between the two. Okay. Now, he doesn't exactly specify what side God is on. From some of the things I read in the Bible, I think he may be over to the evil side. But, well, well there, yeah. is, there is that verse in the Bible, which we tried to find, and I don't have my reference in front of me. We only tried to find it about two yeah. minutes ago. So yeah, we had it was very quickly, but there, there is you know, that, that passage in, the, in Scripture where God says, I create evil. That's right. Now, you know, um, that's, of course, one of those that Christians are going to immediately jump on and say, no, 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 you're not interpreting it in the proper context, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's there. But above and beyond that, who cares what, the, what's the, what is the scriptural basis or not of any of these claims, okay? The point is, okay, that... This kind of holy rolling language, you know, God's on my side and, and I'm a soldier for God and I'm doing what I do because I'm carrying out the will of God and this and that. This kind of language is, is the same sort of justification that people uh, everywhere all over the world have been using for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries to justify their actions. And, um, you know, just as the 19 terrorists had a five-page list of instructions and prayers, okay, that mentioned God 88 times, okay, you know, and now we are on our side trying to say, and we're fighting, you know, for our God, and this is, you know, and God's on our side in this conflict, and, you know, if, if, if we didn't, if, if the human race just didn't have this tendency to lapse into this God language at the drop of a hat, you know, most of these problems and wars and things that we're facing with each other, you know, wouldn't be going on in the first place. Yeah, we might you know. be able to come to some sort of uh, better solution. Well, you know, God, gods are uh, historically, again, it's the number, gods are the number one reason that people have, like, found to be, you know, terrible to each other. And, 
you know, they are a reason that people have used to be nice to each other, but on, on a global scale, they are a much bigger cause for people being terrible to each other. Well, a little bit closer to home are... Uh our evangelist dressed as a politician, Governor Rick Perry, <laughs> uh, is, of course, on the campaign trail for re-election, or should mm -hmm. I say election, since he was never elected governor the first time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shows that, uh, in Longview, uh, Texas, he was on the campaign stump there, mm -hmm. uh, spoke at Longview Church, and said, I'm going to advance the cause of faith, because the seeds of faith are rooted not only in me, but in the roots of this country and Texas. Uh, his speech was sandwiched between speakers from Wall Builders and Vision America, groups encouraging churchgoers to become involved in public policy. Uh, Perry also said, Last fall, I received a little criticism for bowing my head at a public school and uttering the word, Amen. You know what? I didn't he do said it. more than that. I didn't do it because it is popular. I did it because it was right. I have yet to run across many people who don't feel it's important for children to pray in school, there, once again, we have Rick Perry this distortion. mandating uh, majority rule for religious civil rights. Well, and again, he's distorting the issue. It is not illegal to pray That's in right. school. It is illegal for the school as a government body to do what you just said, mandate which prayers are said to which God in the context of which religion and at which time of day. That's right. Okay. Right now, any student of any faith of any type can drop to their knees at any you know and, and, and pray till they're blue in the face if they want to. You can pray over your, you know, say grace over your lunch. You can, you know, pray before a football game that you don't get legs broken or what have you. You can do whatever you want in terms as a, as a school student in America in terms of pr privately praying. What cannot be done is the school getting up there with this showboating, which is what Rick Perry is doing, yep. public displays of religion and mandating, no, this is what prayer you say, this is the time of the school day you say it, and this is how you worship. Okay? It, they're trying to take away the parent's right to, to uh, control their child's religious edu uh, instruction. They're trying to take that away from the parents and put it in the hands of the government. Yeah, and it's, it's and obviously going to be a, a Christian uh, basis. There's no doubt about Gee, that. Gee, you think? So, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, and even if it's not, even if they manage to make some non-sectarian, wishy-washy prayer, that should offend religious people even more. Yeah. You know, what's the point of okay, it? To whom it may concern. Uh, now, you. here, uh, Perry is getting a little bit on the Bush uh, camp here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this will sound familiar to you. Uh -huh. And to you, if you've been watching, when we've been talking about some of the things that uh, Bush has said. I want people of faith on my side, not just voting on election day, but by hoisting me up, by getting down on your knees and lifting me up in prayer. So, uh, you remember we were talking about Bush and his, <laughs> I feel your prayers. Uh, uh, and, so, yeah, and then yeah, choking you know. on a pretzel ooh, the two ooh, days later, ooh, yeah. Ooh. Right. Now, um... I... I, I <laughs> This is primitive behavior. Uh, yeah. and, I mean, this is, this is... And then talk about being divisive. Ah. Uh, he said, those who have a different view of things are already organizing. That's the dum, evil, dum, evil dum, people dum. like us. He yeah, also it, it, said... It, it, all, all those people who stand up for that pesky U.S. Constitution. Yes, and he also that, made it even more of a, of, of a divisive issue by saying, will you stand in the gap with those of us who believe there's a God and a God who is strong? We can stand in the gap together and speak about issues we believe in, and we will make a difference, and we will be victorious. God bless this great state of Texas. Not a dry eye in the house after uh, that, I can tell you. Yeah, or dry pair of underwear. Either. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, so he, he's making it, he's making it a divisive uh, okay. right there. Which under is he, uh, he's making it a real divisive uh, issue by sorry, by Dan. making it a battle. Will you stand in the gap and stand uh, for God in this election? Yep, 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 yep. Uh, pretty much what he's mm -hmm. saying. Anyway, so Are you gonna look up something. I'm looking up something, but okay, please continue. Well, let me go on yeah. with uh, uh, Miss Cleo. <laughs> Tell it all to Miss Cleo. She oh, knows yeah. everything. Okay. Ooh. Describing it as permeated with fraud, the Federal Trade Commission <laughs> has gone to court in an effort to shut down Miss Cleo's psychic hotline. Yeah. Florida authorities announced a separate lawsuit challenging the service's spokeswoman. Yuri Del Harris, known as Miss Cleo, mm -hmm. to prove that she really is a renowned shaman from Jamaica. Yeah, actually, I think she's an actress from Brooklyn. But yes, uh. I do think so. Uh, <laughs> there are also uh, uh, the companies that are actually behind Miss Cleo uh -huh. have also been sued by Arkansas, Illinois, Missouri, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Wow. <laughs> the FTC complaint filed Wednesday 
accuses the service of misdeeds, including false promises of free psychic readings, tricky billing tactics to squeeze money out of consumers, and unre unrelenting and abusive telemarketing calls. Uh, you know, this... Uh, yeah, you know, she should have read her tarot cards. She should have seen this coming. Well, this What's is, the deal? This is interesting. Howard Beals, the agency, the FTC's agency's director of consumer protection, said, considering the laundry list of unfair and deceptive practices in this case, it's a mystery to us why Miss Cleo and her employers haven't seen this coming. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, did you find what you're looking for? I did. Yeah, I just uh, we had a we had a tip from our uh, control room uh, with the the passage is Isaiah 45:7, which interestingly enough, this is the new revised standard version. Now this one's kind of cleaned up a bit. Yes, there's. But a... where in Isaiah 45:7, where God is basically well, he starts back in five where he says, "I'm the Lord, there is no other besides me." Da 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 da. He's basically staking out his turf, and then he says, "I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things." Now, if you go back to the King James version. Instead of saying I make wheel and create woe, it's create evil, evil. not right. create woe. Yes. And um, well, let's clean that horrible Bible up as the years go by. <laughs> yeah. So a little white out, you'll make your Bible well, friendly, they, friendly. But you know, aren't they doing that though? Didn't oh, the yeah. Roman with yeah. the, these latest with the translations uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls completed? They are doing some. They say they're going to be spending five years revising the Bible. Now, that's going to send all the literalists into a panic, mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and there's going to be a lot of argument about that. But it should be interesting. Mm. So, anyway, that's that. Well, well, we've got a few more things to, for the news here. Okay. In Nebraska, a federal judge issued his own commandment Tuesday in a case involving mm -hmm. a granite Ten Commandments marker in a Plattsmouth City Park. Mm -hmm. U.S. District Judge Richard Kopf <clears throat> said the city of Plattsmouth must remove the monument as its placement in Memorial Park violates the constitutional separation of church and state. Uh, Plattsmouth City officials had argued the monument had historical value. I question that. I would like to see exactly what historical value that has to the United States. Mm. Harmed no one and should be protected by the First Amendment's guarantee of religious freedom. Now, that's a screwy interpretation if I've ever seen one. Well, a, a, a monument on public land, on mm -hmm. government land, basically, uh, mm -hmm. is guarantees personal religious freedom for the citizens. Well... It's so on private land. On private land, you can put up whatever you want. Yes. But, but again, public land, got to remain neutral. And now we have a precedent. In his ruling, Kopf cited a 7th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruling involving a Ten Commandments marker in Elkhart, Indiana, as the basis for his decision. Hmm. Uh, that's a, an excellent precedent that was set, and I, it's already been used here, and I'm sure it will be used in other court cases yeah. involving this. Well, that's good, yeah, and, and uh, including your own. Right? Including yes. you know, the one that uh, hopefully will get the, the monument uh, here in Texas down. Indeed. Now, the last one. Yeah, in the, the, uh, the Ten Commandments monument with 11 commandments on it. Yeah, yes. That one. <laughs> the one we have. Doctors in an Indian village say they're losing business to a holy man selling a divine urine cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> Residents of Chomo Ber Kalan in Punjab are queuing up to have urine blessed by 86-year-old Tantric Baba. Reports, <laughs> reports okay. say he tells his patients to bring along five liters, five liters of their partner's urine, which they then drink. The holy man says the cocktail can <laughs> oh, get rid of any disease on earth. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I feel like a man of 20 after trying out the medicine. <laughs> I can't wait to have more of it. 60-year-old farmer Satwant Singh Bular, who claims to have been cured of impotence after drinking the urine, said, a local doctor said he's turning them into compulsive urine drinkers. It's time someone put a stop to this nonsense or we will be forced to close shop. Oh, dear. Uh, which, uh, these people drinking this stuff, I wonder about their denomination. Do you think they're possibly Episcopalian? Don't! Zing! Got it. I don't know. All those uh, doctors sure do sound pissed, pissed off. off. Zing! Oh! <laughs> well, they're afraid well, of losing business. Oh, that's right. And if, if they keep going to him and yeah. don't go to the doctors, then pretty soon they're gonna have, doctors aren't going to have pot to piss in. Yeah. Well, so, dang, got it. Oh, Alrighty man. then. It's just going down the toilet. Had enough fun with the news today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. Well, yeah, I think that's one to send the uh, the Rationalist International group uh, over there to... Uh, yeah, I'm there, sure. There is a... There is a uh, we actually had a call a, a couple of years ago from a guy when we were in the big studio who was, like, trying to advocate this, like, drinking of urine and what have you. And there's a show, I remember that. We had a, one of our guests was a fellow named Rowan Weinar, who I don't know if you've met, who was an old, old member of our group um, since... since, since think has gone on, but he's, uh, Rowan is, is uh, an expert on pseudoscience and yeah. various quack theories and stuff like that, and we talked about it, and it was just sort of like, ultimately, I think it came down to, dude, if you want to 
drink your urine, you know, <laughs> fine, you know, just don't, you know, it might be hard for you to make friends after that, but, you know, just what, it, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's just funny stuff. Okay, um, our phone number, if you want to call us live, I guess we can go ahead and put that on the air. Uh, this is a live call and show. You can uh, give us a uh, jingle and tell us what you think about stuff and ask us what we think about stuff. Uh, we had a caller last week um, towards the end of our program. Um, we were spend- we spent a lot of time last week, uh, uh, more than we usually did uh, before getting to the calls, uh, because we had that uh, intelligent design debate uh, that I wanted to critique. And so we talked about that actually for well into halfway into the show. Uh, so we didn't get to take as many call- callers last week as um, we usually do, but uh, we did have one guy late in the show who... Um, uh, a Christian caller who asked us about uh, like order and design questions, and um, he threw out the watchmaker argument. Well, that well, that well, that was an earlier guy. Oh, okay, okay. Right. but but he was sort of kind of trying to follow up on that, and uh, th- I wanted to address his point, but didn't have time to, and and I and I told him that I would bring some uh, in, in a material to the show today to address that, and that is that um, what you will often find uh, like creationists and uh, uh, Christians. Uh, doing is using phrases do using the words order and design as like the single phrase like the two the two terms just belong together like Inter- interchangeably like hot dog and mustard right and what I was trying to point out was that you cannot necessarily infer the that is from from examples of order in nature and of course order does exist in nature because we can see it and observe it and check it out but um, there's no basis to automatically infer from that, that that this order is the result of any sort of intelligent design. And, you know, the question that I always pose to guys who call us up with the watchmaker argument and what have you, and, and just to let our viewers know, if you're new to this show or if you've never called us before, we have on our fine website a frequently asked questions page, a fact list, where um, we... Uh, Answer some of the most basic, there it is, right there, the most basic questions that we usually get from callers. And that's one of them. And so, you know, if you're thinking about calling us up and asking us, if you're walking along a beach and you happen to, you know, yeah, yeah we've been there, we've done, done that. <laughs> All of those are there on the fact page, which is right there at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> and that's one of them. But I wanted to read, uh, recommend a couple of things. First off, of course, is this terrific book which is uh, Blind Watchmaker by Dawkins. And, of course, you will hear the name Dawkins uh, referred to um, quite often in the uh, context of, uh, like, uh, evolutionary biology and that sort of thing. He's one of the world's leading zoologists, expert in the field. And, of course, this is the book where he... Um, now, he would agree, in principle, yes, I think that, uh, you know, uh, organisms in nature exhibit design. But, um, you know, he... Uh, but as he exp- goes on to explain in this book, you know, the designer is... You know the, the the forces of nature that are being acted upon uh, evolution through natural selection, and um, you know he tackles the eye, he tackles a lot of other stuff in there. So that's that's very much worth reading. And I also wanted to read um, just a few passages from uh, this book here, which uh, is um, very highly reputed um, uh, a book on the subject of atheism uh, by a much admired writer. Now, of course, and I know that some people say, "Well, you know, it's not like that's going to be an unbiased book." Well, no, but that's the whole point. Yeah, an atheism book is is there to um, explain atheist arguments, and this is where he is discussing his, some of his criticisms of the design arguments. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just uh, I'm going to concentrate on a couple of the salient points, which is that uh, uh, the most popular design arguments are the teleological argument, which is just inferring design from you know looking at nature and seeing stuff that seems to make sense to you. And uh, what he, he points out, the crux of the teleological argument and its fundamental error lies in the assumption that order presupposes conscious design, where order refers to regularity in nature. This is demonstrably false. It is true that order exists in the universe, that there is regularity in nature, that, enti- that entities will behave in the same way under the same circumstances. But it is not valid to infer from this the existence of any master designer. On the contrary, order is simply the manifestation of causality, and causality is a derivative a logical corollary of the law of identity. And earlier in the book, he explains what those things are, that, you know, something, the law of identity is something is what it is. And uh, in order to exist, to, to exist is to exist as something. And to be something is to sp- possess specific determinate characteristics. So in order to exist at all, you at least, you know, you're molecules, right? You at least have to exhibit some degree of order you know, otherwise you're just not there. Uh, it is a mistake to confuse order with design. If there is design in nature, there must be a designer, but the same is not true of order. Order does not presuppose an orderer. It is simply entailed by the nature of existence itself. And then uh, just later on, well, he just uh, has a brief paragraph here where he says, I think this is interesting, the real alternative facing us 
is in the design argument is between natural necessities, which is you know what we just described, mm -hmm. things taking shape and exhibiting order uh, because they have to, uh, and supernatural caprice. According to the naturalist, the universe exhibits order because order is one aspect of existence. The two are inseparable. According to the theist, the universe is inherently unstable and chaotic, but God, an unknowable being, somehow glues it together using unspecified and unknowable means. Once again, the choice between naturalism and supernaturalism is a choice between reason and magic. And again, we tried to pin down uh, Kirk Durston uh, two Fridays ago on this whole question when he uh, kept reiterating the point that, well, you know, ident intelligent design is just required for all this stuff to go on. And we said, well, how does this intelligent designer do what he does? You know, what are the mechanisms that he employs? Uh, how much functional information, remember that nut yeah. nonsense, you know, how much of that would be required simply for this designer you know, that you're positing to exist? Where would that have come from? Da 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 da. And he just responded to that with saying, "Well, you know, I can't explain that, but it's there." You know. So and, and so when I say you're retreating into his incomprehensible, mm -hmm. you know, God, and and we're back to God of the gaps again. But anyway, but that's just some interesting points uh, to make. And <clears throat> but again, uh, Blind Watchmaker, I highly recommend by Dawkins. And uh, Dawkins, though, actually has some less technical books that are easy, you know, easier to. It's kind of work quite a few books out there. All of them are good. Yeah. All of them probably explain. Yeah, uh, a lot of that pretty you know the same way. Yeah, actually, I tell people to check like before jumping into Blind Watchmaker, you know, uh, try something like River Out of Eden. Yeah, that's a really good book. Yeah, because that's much more much less technical, and then you can work your way into because Blind Watchmaker and Blind Watchmaker also has a sequel called uh, Climbing Mount Improbable. Yes. Uh, and, and and again, those are very thorough and detailed, but super technical and scientific, and, and it helps if you have a little knowledge of what you're talking about. So anyway, okay, 30 minutes into the show, it is time to jump on these calls. So let's talk hey, to... Isn't caller one already on? Uh, no, well, no, no you have to be... Well, Perry? Yeah. Hi, uh, have on. you been on all this time? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, okay, I don't know, something must have happened in the control room, too. All right, well, we got you on the air now. Uh, how you doing? Oh, great. Um, I had a question and a comment about Jesus. Okay, um, okay. Let's get the volume where we can... There you go. We're working our volume I, so we can hear you. I've been um, a non-believer for many years now, and I'd always assumed, um, with all the talk about Jesus, that he was a historical figure. But when I researched it, I could never find any documents or anything um, from the time that Jesus was supposed to have been alive, uh, at least none that exists today. And I was wondering what y'all think of if uh, Jesus is historical or not. Well, uh, I, I, I question it. Uh, I've actually, I read a good book called The Jesus Puzzle, and I cannot remember Earl Doherty, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y, I think is his name, where he, re he really goes into that, uh, showing that there are no original documents from the time of Jesus that mention him. There are some from uh, quite a number of years after his death, mm -hmm. uh, which can't be attributed to a first-rate source. You mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, There's nothing in... in terms of contemporary times. Uh, I, I question, I think that there's uh, enough evidence to, to question it, uh, whether he existed or not, but I, I also think that even if he did exist, obviously he, he was not uh, supernatural in any way. And right. it was actually quite common at the time of Jesus for people to supposedly have been born of a virgin, raised from the dead, healed the sick. So actually the, the story of Jesus was quite common yeah, during Mithras that time frame. Mithras was a, a, was a um, widely worshipped messianic figure. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I could go mm. either way on it. He may, he may have existed, he may not have. It doesn't really matter to me because even if he did, obviously he wasn't supernatural. Right. Yeah. I was just thinking that uh, for the time frame of which everything that was written about him that survives today, I just figured that uh, if he did exist, we really don't know much about him. Yeah, um, a, a point that has, has been made, again, by a lot of, of, of scholars, both um, theists and non-theists and just general religious scholars, is that um, the, the absence of, of information about Jesus from uh, texts that, were, that may very well have been written in the time uh, is is quite telling. I mean, there were there were contemporary historians living in Judea and and were and, and writing about the life and times of that period, uh, you know, whose works we have, whom we know about, and uh, the New Testament, the Gospels, you know, portray Jesus as being very widely known and very popular. Um, you know, going about doing his healings and doing his miracles and speaking to to the people and what have you. 
And so you think, okay, well, if we were to go by that as some sort of guide, then, we're, then we ought to be able to find plenty of references in, in the contemporary uh, writings, uh, current events, if you will, the writings of that time uh, about this figure, and we don't find those, and that's very interesting. Um, there is, there is um, a, a writer, now there was a writer by the name of Flavius Josephus, um, who, who had written a, a book uh, that has a passage in it called the Testamentum Flavinium, I think. Right. And uh, that is widely held to be a later, is a forged passage that was inserted into the text later um, by, by, you know, uh, elders in the church or what have you. But The funny yeah. thing is, is that Josephus uh, was born after Jesus died. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, even then, you know, mm-hmm. very, real contemporary. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and you know, and, and the Paul never met Jesus. And, you know, most of, uh, and of course, all of Paul's writings, you know, were, are dated to, you know, long after Jesus died. So, and, and it, it is very reasonable to say that, uh, you know, the spread of Christianity across the globe as this worldwide, you know, religious juggernaut is, is, the, is based upon, you know, it's the duty of Paul. I mean, he's the guy who made that happen. It wasn't anything that Jesus did. So Paul is probably has more responsibility for the success of Christianity than Jesus. So, and, and because of that, you know, Paul could very well have, you know, it's not even necessary for him to have met Jesus. Anyway, so, but yeah, the, the, the uh, historical value of the Gospels and the Bible is, is a subject of much debate. And um, very interesting. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Thanks, right, thanks for watching. Well, here we have... Lazarus on line two, so okay. maybe he can tell us about Jesus. Yes. Raised right. from the dead. Uh, right. Well, it, well, I'll be very pleased and surprised if it's the same Lazarus. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well, doing Good. well. What's up? Hey, um, th- well, that was pretty funny, pretty funny. Yeah. Um, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, you probably, you, you probably get that a lot, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I get it. So. But the thing I, the thing I um, have a question about, Jesus is this. Okay. Um... Now, are you atheist because you don't believe in the biblical interpretation of God or the Quranic ter- ter- interpretation of God or the Hindu interpretation of God or the Buddhist interpretation of God, or are you just atheist in general? Yeah, I'm an atheist because I don't believe gods and goddesses exist. Okay. I, believe in, I don't believe in any supernatural deity or being at all. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you this. Okay. And this, this is the thing about it. I had to recently reconcile my beliefs because I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm one of these new type of beliefs that I believe in Darwin's evolution, but yet I believe also that it's a creator that started this evolutionary process. And I do not believe in the genesis, genesis creation of, uh, of man. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do yeah, I think, I think a lot of mainstream Christians actually more than you might realize tend to take that view. Yeah. Um, uh, the the extreme creationist point of view is is very much a minority religious view. Yeah. The fact is those people are very well funded and and yeah. and very media savvy, and so they're able to get that uh, get their point of view heard. Exactly. But let me point po- uh, point to you this. Mm-hmm. Okay, if for say for instance, okay, this whole our whole solar system, our whole way of life got started by a big bang. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's suppose this. Okay, now. If there was a force that started that Big Bang, right, mm-hmm. could you accept that as being God? Well, uh, not, not automatically, right? I mean, again, we don't know what the force was that made the Big Bang happen. Okay. Okay, we don't have that information. I understand that. Now, if we were to get some kind of information pointing towards an explanation of that force... Yeah. Again, you know, you, you, I have to reserve a judgment until all that information is in. Now, uh, you know, I, I don't, it's not appropriate to just attach names to things that you don't have a full explanation of because, of course, you could be, you know, completely off base. So you really want to make sure that uh, you know what it is that you're giving a name to and whether or not that name is appropriate. Okay, but um, let's take the law of conservation mass, right? And then also let's apply in conjunction with that the law of subtraction, right? So basically you take any any inanimate object or animate object, friend, and you just, uh, just purely um, subtract from that, right? Like say, for instance, you take a point of reference, any point of reference, a man or a creature or a rock or anything, right? Mm-hmm. And you subtract from that. Okay, what is a rock made of? Okay, if you get down to the ultimate thing, it's made of atoms, okay? 
Now, if you get that, where did that come from? Okay, and then you keep subtracting all that, even when you get to the Big Bang, right? What I'm getting to is, is this, is that eventually you get to the point of nothingness, all right? Something I'm not did sure not I come from nothing. You know, well, so what you you're saying is when we, when, we call, always exists. when we call whatever the, if we were to able to find a first cause of exactly. everything, would we call that first cause God? Would you call the first that calls those being, those things to come in? But God, see, I think exactly. that, okay, here's why that's a bogus argument. Yeah. And I'll, <clears throat> the problem is, is you, uh, you know, by uh, by the by the very definition of of the first cause argument, okay, okay, which is that complex things must, you know, complexity is what we use to gauge whether or not we think something had to have had some sort of intelligent force behind it. Okay. The problem with with um, going back to this whole idea of a first cause, okay, mm-hmm. is that it appears to be a, a simply a completely unprovable distinction. I mean, even if you were to a- able to identify the signature of some sort of creative force, uh, however you may come about that information, uh, as you know, as we explore the universe and finding, and if we were to be finding that sort of thing, we're actually not finding that sort of thing. We're finding other stuff. But let's say we were to get out there and uh, maybe find something that uh, that was evidence of some sort of supernatural reason uh, that why the universe exists. We still would not have settled the question of the nature of that thing, you know. Then, because then we now have a whole new mystery to solve. Well, what is this creative force? Uh, how does it function? And where did it come from? I mean, there's no reason to just automatically assume that anything could not be created or, or would not be created. If you want to say, well, this had to, the universe had to have been created because of the way it you know, all functions and, and the form that it takes and, and all the beauty and, and order and stuff that we see. Uh, but, hmm, how did it get here? Well, that's a big puzzler. So why don't we just introduce a concept, we'll call it God, and oops, we'll deal with the sticky problem of how it may have been created just by saying that it didn't have to be. Well, you haven't really solved the mystery there. You've just, you've come up with what's called God of the gaps, which is, you know, whatever gap you have in your knowledge of, of, of an understanding of how the universe works, well, you just fill that in with something that you're comfortable with. But if you keep subtracting things, you're eventually going to get to nothing, right? Well, no, see, I don't know that you follow. I mean, for example, if you were to, I mean, let's say if we were to trace the universe back to a god, well, then what, what, how, how would you be able to, what sort of, how, how would you be able to uncover evidence that that being was not created? Um, why, why would it be inappropriate to assume that he, he See, was that's created? That's the argument there. But I mean, I, you know, they, then you do run it. What you run into is this problem of infinite regress. Well, you know, well, what created God? Well, either something had to have created God by by virtue of the same logic that you're using to apply an argument that the universe had to be created by a God, or if this God was not created by some other force. Well, we now need to be able to demonstrate how it is that this being could ex- have existed without itself having been created. Okay. You haven't really solved any mysteries. You've just still, added a new mystery to this mystery of the universe. But you're still applying a man's... What I'm saying is you're still applying a man's interpretation to this. What I'm well, what else can like I this, apply? Okay, if I started the Big Bang... Okay, let's say, for instance, I know I could now. But say I started the Big Bang, okay, right? Some yes, but, ac- but now you're applying a man's interpretation. Or by, by purpose, I start the Big Bang. Then I am, by definition, God. I, uh, I, if you, you could be by definition Floyd. Okay, I mean, exactly. I don't see that. That's, I don't see that. That's that. That's any sort of answer to the big mystery. What I'm trying to say is, is this: it doesn't matter if we once we get to nothingness. That once we get to that point, that something created, whether indirectly or directly by accident or by per, on purpose, whether to ask the question whether that person was created or not. Because that, that well, you're still dealing with a man's interpretation of God. But again, well, what other sort of interpretation can I possibly have? No, hang on. I mean, what sort of other interpretation can I possibly have? I mean, I am a man, yeah. and I have my level of understanding of things, exactly. and that's really all that I can possibly use. Exactly. You know, and so, sure, you can speculate about stuff that, you know, but at that, you know, uh, you know that maybe this, this is beyond, and this, that's beyond, and that's yeah. beyond. But now all you're doing is you're just, you're back to pure speculation, and you're not answering questions. 
You know, you're, you're, you're retreating into, well, there's this thing, but now it's incomprehensible. Well, we but an incomprehensible thing is no law. sort of an answer. Like Newton's third law of physics, right, says that, um, uh, basically states that what? Um, uh, no mo- uh, uh, an object in motion will tend to stay in motion unless acted upon a... Uh, well, that's the first one. The first that's the one. first okay. law of the third law of Yeah. Well, but, but, any, but, okay, well, I'll let you make your point. Okay, well, the point is, is this, okay, something has to start something in motion. It just doesn't just start in motion. You're violating the laws of physics when you do that. There well, has to be a force acting upon it. Well, and now you for that force to have been there had to be a force acting upon that. And for that there had to be a force but, acting but again, upon why infinite does, regression. Yeah, but exactly. again, why why is but why is this concept that you want to call God exempt from that rule then? If everything if if everything has to be the result of causation, yeah. You know, then why would the deity or the, the thing that caused the Big Bang to happen, why wouldn't something have had to have acted upon that thing so that it could cause the Big Bang to happen? And going back, why, you know, something would have had to have acted upon the thing that acted upon the thing you want exactly. to call God, to, you see? So again, we're just adding more mysteries to the mystery. We aren't really solving any mysteries. Well, and, and even if you get, let's say you get to a final point, let's say that we can come to a definite this is a, a beginning. This this was not created. It just always has been. Uh, uh, if you can say, well, since we don't really know because we can't really go there, uh, God is the first cause. God is is the uncaused cause. He was yeah. not created. He always has been, and He caused everything else. Okay. Then you could logically make that same claim about nature. If God can be an uncaused cause, if anything can be an uncaused cause, then nature can be the uncaused cause. It's it, it, in just the same vein. We, we can't go all the way back to the beginning to know, but we see today <laughs> natural processes occurring in our world. We do not see uh, supernatural processes occurring. So if you want to take the, the natural processes that we see back and back and back, then you'll come to a natural first cause. Do you see what okay. I'm saying? No. Oh, okay. See, the, the, the points that you're raising and the questions that you're asking aren't invalid questions. Lots of people have asked them for a long time, and no. they're a, con- a constant uh, source of debate. Sure. Yeah. But uh, all I'm saying is that before reaching conclusions about things, of course, you need to have all your information in. That's all. And I, I, it, it is a, it's a classic example of the rush to judgment to simply pick something about a particular situation, say the nature of the universe and existence itself, that's a big one, and just whatever about that concept you don't have a full understanding of, just call that God and leave it at that. I mean, uh, that's really not the way that you investigate things in a scientific way. But but your points and the questions that you raise are valid ones. I'm just saying that, you know, it's... So you believe that there's no such thing as a first cause? I don't have evidence to that one way or another. I think that the concept of a first cause is improbable because, as David just pointed out, um, if, if there is something in, if, if there's no reason to assume that if God was an uncaused thing, that nothing else could be uncaused. And so how can you make, again, and, and even if you find a thing and want to say, well, this was uncaused, how could you prove that? And yeah. What sort of experiments could you possibly do, right, to, to establish that this was an uncaused Thing. But anyway, yeah. it's it's a very interesting uh, you know area of debate, and we uh, we got to move on to our next guy. Okay, but we really I do appreciate app- it though. Yeah, but All we right. appreciate hearing from you. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. That's a good call. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, th- these aren't dumb questions, but a lot of dumb answers can come out of those questions if you rush to make a decision before you have all the information in hand. Um, but, you know, it's like you said, it's part of the human experience to wonder, you know, why are we here and what's it all about? And Anyway, let's go to... Uh, B- Mike on 3 is next, I do believe. Mike on 3. Hello, Mike. Hi, guys. Hey, you're on the air. Thanks for waiting. I was just, uh, you know, sort of amused by Ashcraft's comment that his God is... Uh, uh, the cause of our freedom and liberty and stuff. Uh, hmm. I always thought he was a Christian. Uh, the God of the Bible is very much pro-slavery. And Leviticus 44 through 46 talks about how you can buy people to be your slaves, and mm-hmm. you can pass them on to your kids, and they'll be your, their, your kids' slaves you know, forever. Just If they have kids, they're your slaves. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also talks about how you can treat your slaves. You can uh, beat them as much as you want, and as long as they are able to get up and walk away within two days, you're fine, but if you kill him, then you should be punished. <laughs> like, uh-oh. But, uh, I mean, the God of the Bible is very much pro-slavery, and how Christians, if they read the Bible, how they can make these claims, oh, we get our freedom from God. Yeah. Uh, he gives freedom to certain people, not 
heathens. <laughs> right. Well, um, you know, but you know what they're going to say when you bring that up. Oh, that's Old Testament. Yeah, but again, yeah. the uh, yeah. Old Testament is part of the Bible, and mm-hmm. sure. uh, it is the. Uh, I mean, it, it is used to justify uh, believing in the, the New Testament. Mm-hmm. In fact, even uh, places in the New Testament talks about, uh, you know, you, you cannot discard the, the laws of the Old Testament. So that mm-hmm. argument of theirs is just, again, it's like other arguments, null and void. Right. Ash, Ashcroft is a, he's actually a very deeply committed Christian, and it's a good point you brought up because it's a little known fact. I think he does indeed have slaves, actually, because he's such a committed... No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Can we you on that? You just made that up. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it is also true that in, in uh, Paul's writings, right, I mean, he, he, he mentions, uh, and, oh, look, Matthew, oh, I'm, giving, I'm being given a scripture reference right here, and I'll turn to that while our I'm talking. Our crack team. Yeah, I tell you. behind the scenes giving us Well, scripture. we have our, our producer who's just gone, gotten done uh, reading this cover to cover, and so he kind of knows. But, um, you know, so Paul brings up that, uh, you know, from a New Testament perspective, right, I mean, I think uh, what a, this, a slave's, um, you know, the thing that slaves are really need to be out there concentrating on doing is not figuring out ways to attain their freedom, but uh, pleasing their masters. Exactly. You know, yeah. That's what they need to be doing. Right there. Okay, five seventeen twenty. Uh, I've been given the scripture reference here, Matthew five seventeen twenty. So I'll read it, and we'll just see. Do, oh, here we are. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For blah 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 blah. Well, okay, I'm trying to. Until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter of the. I'm, I'm passed from the law. It's okay, Jesus this, okay, this is Testament talking law. about. Okay, oh, we're not talking about the slavery thing here. We're talking about. Uh, you, know, you have to consider the Old Testament laws still. Yeah. Uh, well, this is you, Jesus himself saying that. All right. Yeah. If you go to go to Titus uh, two, uh, paragraph nine, it talks about uh, teach slaves to be subject to the masters and everything mm-hmm. to try to please them, not to talk back to them. Uh, so again, you know, I mean, Paul is very much pro slavery. Uh, to me. If you're a Christian, you got to be pro-slavery. Yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're not pro-slavery, you can't believe everything in the Bible, and so why believe any of it? Right. Well, you know, um, here's, here's the thing. Um, sure, we can, all, we can sit here all day and, and point out all the nasty, you know, inhumane stuff that's in the Bible and have all kinds of fun with that. But, you know, the, what the, the point is that you get guys like Ashcroft, right, and you get guys like Falwell and Robertson, and, and you know, the... You know, um, Jeff D. Had a, has a name for the Bible. It's the big book of multiple choice. Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you pick and choose the bits of it that you like and that you find, uh, you know, morally acceptable. And you just sort of turn a blind eye to the bits that you find morally unacceptable. Um, and I find that this is endemic not only to uh, just, you know, the, the habits of individual believers, but um, the way the Bible is taught. I mean, I never learned okay, about these passages in the New... When I was a young, you know, guy, you know, I was a teenager and an adolescent, going to Sunday school and going to church in Houston, you know, I... I they never read from Second Kings 2, 23, 24. I never heard about the kids being massacred by bears. That's right. I, all God is love and yeah. you're a good person. I, you know, it, California it, Christianity. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, John 3, 6... You know, it's John three sixteen without John three eighteen, and without yeah. John three thirty six. That's kind of what you get in church. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's so you can like, you can always the minute anybody points to scripture and say here this is uh, you know this is the reason why this book is is my uh, you know the the foundation of my entire you know moral fabric. Well, you know you can it, it's very easy to find something in there that uh, completely you know that negates. They say, well, what about this? And they go, oh, well, <laughs> you know, and then either you're not interpreting it properly or what have you. So. Right. Yeah. I think that the, uh, but it's a it, fun point that you brought up. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that would turn people off of Christianity is just if they were to read the Bible. Yeah, I and think. And once they read it, they should say, "Hey, this isn't uh, this isn't right," and they should move on to something else. You're going to say something. I was just going to say I think that the Bible has probably caused more people to become atheists. <laughs> that's really that's what well, that's I mean, what it was with me when I actually went to Christian mm-hmm. college and really studied the Bible. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I would disagree with you on one point, though. I think that again, you have these folks are. The willingness of somebody to be extremely selective and pick the things out of it that they think are good and just gloss over or ignore or even just simply not read the passages. Well, yeah, I guess they should do like we always told you to do is read the Bible with an open mind. And if you read it with an open mind, then they'll oh. yeah. what uh, we're trying to do. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you go to the next caller. Yeah, so that was a fun point you brought up. And, of course, we appreciate you watching. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. And that was Mike on three, was it not? No, okay. No. Uh, now uh, you you know went through the whole training battery right yes, now yeah. so I uh, I'm full, very the I, full brainwash effect yeah I mean yeah anything ba- anything based upon that little period of your life that you could use to sh- reflect upon what he just said I mean did you encounter that when you were 
Because you said what happened was when you were in, in that Christian college, right? Mm -hmm. You had these questions, and either they wouldn't or couldn't answer the questions. And I'd like to know a little... I, well, I, I'm it, 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 dying to know more about those exchanges. Uh, well, it was... Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, ex of exchanges. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess if there were, yeah. It, really, it was, it was just... It really was just me sitting down and reading the Bible, and I, I guess I was just kind of unsatisfied because I had come across a few passages that were questionable to me in terms of morality. That was the big thing, the God's morality or the morality as portrayed in the Bible as being uh, condoned or ordered by God. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more I read, just I, it's like I, I read the Bible finally with an objective eye, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't believe that I'd been reading the Bible for years and not, had not seen any of these things. Mm -hmm. It was like they were there the whole time, and I was just going right over them and, you know, uh, practicing that God is good, God is love, you know, all the little lambs, and, and you know, mm -hmm. let's all sit down and lay with the lambs in the grass, and everything's good. And uh, I just never noticed all the stuff. And then it was just when I started to really read the Bible objectively, uh, it was just like, wow, this is, this is really amazing that I've been... Mm -hmm. and, and it occurred to me right then that I, I could not follow teachings that I considered to be so immoral. Mm -hmm. uh, I was more moral than, than this book, so I had to stop that. Yeah. Um, Paul Wilson, one of our members, said the same thing. It was just sort of like, I, I, you know, I couldn't bring myself to love this being right. after reading what this being is doing in this book. Um, but just to, we're going to let our callers uh, kind of build up for a sec. We've got one guy waiting, and we'll get to him. Just five seconds, I want to make one point, which is that as a classic example of, of the turning of the blind eye, um, you can, now this is granted a very extreme case, but I, over the last week, uh, had a brief email exchange with a, with a fellow, uh, who I guess found my TBN watch page. Mm. And so, and so he immediately launched into, uh, you know, this, uh, he emailed me with this protracted sermon, okay, you know, telling me that I'd, <clears throat> you know, you know, please, 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 you know, um, confess your sins and do this and, 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 you know, to save your son. And I, and I tried to point out, I said, okay, hang on, let's stop here. If you want to argue, let's do this because I enjoy this. And pointing out to him that, you know, that, um, okay, help, that, that one thing that he refused to acknowledge, and I pointed it out to him several times, was that hell is a threat. And what Christianity essentially does is scare people into believing with this threat of eternal hellfire. Mm -hmm. And he refused to acknowledge that hell was. He said, I'm not threatening you. I'm just telling you. Just. And I said, dude, if you tell somebody that if you don't do what they say, you're going to get hurt, right. that's a threat. Okay. And no matter how just simply and succinctly I put it, he would not address that point. He would simply respond by going into an even harder sermon mode and a harder pleading mode. And I finally just said, look, I think this is pointless for us to be talking. I'm sorry. But this was just an unwillingness to to see. Well, and, you know, my sister, uh, I was talking to her recently, mm -hmm. and she had told me about a movie that she had seen at a, at a church. Mm -hmm. And uh, as she was talking about it, it... it now, your sister's Christian. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, as she was talking about it, it came right back to me. I knew exactly what she was talking about. It was a movie made in the 70s. <laughs> uh, and I, I, now I for, even for left behind... No, no, that's the recent movie. Anyway, it was about the rapture. Ah. The guy, you know, shaving in the you know, and then all of a sudden his little, you know, electric razor drops into the sink because he's gone, you know, mowing the lawn, he's gone. And uh, so now everybody's gone and everybody who's left behind is now, if you don't get the mark, you're going to get tortured and punished. And it ends with these people being brought into like the public square and beheaded. Now, I... Oh, is there a big guillotine at the end? Yes. I, so, you know, I think down. I've seen that one. Yes, well, I told my, I told my sister that's a perfect example of, of fear tactics. And she said no. And I said, let me tell you why I think that's the case. What? I saw that movie in a Baptist church when I was a little kid, and it scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Scared, and, and she said, well, you How know... How can it not be scare tactics to show a big shot of a guillotine? She said, going, well, ah! she said, that's not true, because kids watch <laughs> kids watch Chucky all the time. I said, yeah, but nobody sits to the kids and says, when you go home, by the way, Chucky's for real, he's under yeah. your bed. And if you don't you know? worship him, he'll kill that's you. That's right. Yeah. They, you know, I, the reason it scared me so yeah. much when I was a little kid was because I was in the church, and they were like, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, it's you amazing. Uh, it's just incredible fear tactics. It's It's... It's you know what it is. It's it's emotional abuse is yes. what it is, and it's it's. I think I'll be you know criminal, but that's just me. All right. Anyway, well let's see. Now we have a good uh, lineup of callers, so, so we'll see what they have to say. Brad is on line one. 
Well, Brad. Hello, Howard. Thanks, thanks for waiting so long. That's quite all right. Uh, I, I have a comment regarding the first caller's question concerning the lack of first-person documents concerning the historical Jesus. Okay. Although I'd like to second the opinion of the fear tactics of the church, because I remember getting the hell literally scared out of me. <laughs> watching a PTL club one night about the praise of Satanism on the youth. Oh. And uh, I just scared, All that evil heavy metal music, right? Scared the devil out of me. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's but, what it was meant to do. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but concerning the historical documents. There's a fabulous book by Morton Smith called Jesus the Magician. And in his attempts to discover the historical Jesus, one of his comments is most of the first person documents have either been repressed or destroyed systematically by the church. So the lack of documents may not be telling that there wasn't a historical Jesus, but that the facts may not have necessarily jived with what the presented outcome was desired. And that and that really the best you can do is to go to second and third person documents and hope to find literary references to those first person documents, some of which survived the destruction. Now you said you said that these documents were destroyed or suppressed by the church. Yes. Yeah. The same church putting out the Holy Bible. Yes. Which again talks to that. your pick and choose element of the church, which is, you know, here's everything as it is, except for the parts we don't want you to see. Yeah, well, I know that there was a a, uh, a lot of debate. I mean, you had, between the Muratorian canon, which was the very first New Testament canon, which was assembled around, uh, like, 190, and the, the final New Testament canon that we have right now, which, was, which came about around 200 years after that, um, what uh, you have are centri- a couple centuries of debate over which books and epistles ought to be included, and the big uh, the, the 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 stumbling block that they were finding was you know well which ones can we reliably call divinely inspired or not, and even after uh, the the final New Testament canon was devised, I know that uh, there was still this debate. Um, there are books that are not included in the final New Testament canon, like um, I believe there's uh, the, the, uh, the Saint Ignatius is one of them. Uh, there's uh, the um, I think the Gospel of Thomas might be another. I have a list of them somewhere. But there were books that were not included in the final New Testament canon that many church elders thought, no, these are divinely inspired. You shouldn't leave them out. Whereas there was continued debate over ones that did go in saying, why'd you put you know, those in? Those aren't divinely inspired. I believe James is one of those uh, that um, is, is thought to, by many to have, you know, and back when they were having all those debates, no, that's not a divinely inspired book. So um, now, of course, I'm, I'm, uh, it would be, it's always interesting to know, um, you know, I'd very much like to know how he uncovered, you know, the evidence of which documents might have been destroyed or suppressed and then what the motives may have been at the time. Well, he was dealing I'm, mainly with historical documents, what other uh-huh. historians had, not necessarily that which was divinely inspired. Oh. So his, his tenet was, if you wanted to know the historical Jesus, mm-hmm. you needed to find out not only what the people who liked him had to say about him, which is fairly easy to do, but mm-hmm. also those that didn't like him, what they had to say about him. Mm-hmm. And he, he searched for the sources of people that perhaps disagreed with Jesus' teaching, and there's some fascinating insights about why he was really crucified, which, which wasn't for messianic claims, but for violations of, of performing magic, hence the title Jesus the Magician. Hmm. Well, this, well so I, I'm quite interested in checking that book Yeah, it'd be out. interesting to see, see his research. So what's, what was the author's name again? I believe it's Morton Smith. Okay. Uh, and it is available through uh, your favorite... Oh, okay, well, we can't uh, say that. Well, but, I was uh, going to say your online... Well, we, we can't say that. <laughs> but, okay, we have, we have, a, they have strict rules here at uh, the TV studio about uh, not telling people where they can buy stuff. But, well, um, but the name and the author is sufficient, and, you know, Jesus... And anybody who's familiar with the computer can... Yeah, I mean, I mean people know how to buy books out there, but uh, we... Can uh, I tell you the name of the publisher? Oh, sure, you can do that. Yes. Distributed in the USA by Publishers Group West, and I believe it's Seastone is the imprimatur. Okay. Publishers Group West. Okay, well, you know, we'll have a look at that, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll um, try to check it out. But yeah, um, it's, uh, it's certainly another uh, could be another fascinating entry in the uh, the never-ending literature of Jesus and was he a historical figure or not, and if so, what did he really do? Um, so, anything else for us? No, that 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 does it. Okay, well, thanks for your call, Brad. We appreciate that. Bye bye. Okay. All right. Well, let's see, Jerry is online too. Let's see what Jerry has to say. Hello, Jerry. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. Good. Good to hear from you again. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, there were a couple of points I wanted to raise, one of w- which dealt with an earlier caller uh, talking about the idea of the conservation of mass energy, etc. Uh-huh. 
Uh, he had what seems to be a, a false analogy. Uh, he kept talking about taking different types of matter, like stones or whatever, and reducing them further and further and further until you get to nothingness. Mm, yeah. Which is an impossibility. Well, I had a feeling, yeah. You know, basically, as I understand it, matter is a state of energy that interacts against our perceptions. Therefore, you know, all matter is simply energy in a different form. Uh, nothing can be reduced beyond that state of just pure energy. Yeah, I mean, matter itself cannot be created or destroyed. Exactly. And yeah, we did that. That is a tenet of physics that we know. Um, you know, I mean, the worst, most you can do is even if you had the hypothetical disintegrate array, you would reduce it to its quantum particles, which is, you know, just simply waves of energy. Mm -hmm. So that that is a serious flaw in his argument. Um, mm -hmm. But also, there were a couple of things I wanted to, to mention, uh, one of which is, I know that uh, there's been discussion about, you know, for instance, hell being used as a threat, mm -hmm. and the way that Bible colleges, to, to my mind, my, my, my brother is a minister, mm -hmm. and I remember sitting in on some of his classes when I was a kid, and how they really discouraged Socratic debate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, darn that stuff. You know, they, they don't want reason brought to it. Um, and hell being used as a threat, I remember as a child also, they were handing out like little comics showing, you know, how you would burn in hellfire yeah. and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, for, for playing place. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Yes, I mean, <laughs> it was just horrific stuff. And I, I tend to agree with you that it is a form of uh, emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. um, on the subject of the... Uh, Apocrypha and the parts of the Bible that have not been included, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most telling arguments is from actually a figure who was on the side of the religious community on that. Mm -hmm. and that's M.R. James, who did an edition of the apocryphal books of the Bible, those few that had not been completely destroyed. He included fragments of and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Still came down on the side of you know the, the final decisions of the Council of Nicaea and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's one of those books that if you read it, you see right away where his, the arguments just don't hold water about why these didn't belong in the Bible. It's simply because it, it doesn't go along with what he was taught. Are you, are you talking about uh, when you read the Apocrypha? Yes. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, and and there, there are things in the Apocrypha such as, you know, a tale of Christ when he was a juvenile and, and lost his temper and basically annihilated, you know, half a town's worth of children because he was ticked, things like that. Yeah, I've heard something about that, and, and uh, um, either hurting or killing one of his teachers. Yes. Something like that. There is, there is a, a book where those, a lot of those apocryphal uh, stories were collected a few years ago, and I want to think of a name. Well, you know, if they'd have had the Ten Commandments on the wall in Jesus', school, Jesus is he school, would not have killed his teacher. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but I, I want to think in the name of that. The, there was a book that uh, was published, I'd say, uh, I, uh, about five years ago. And I remember, um, and a fellow by the name of Stephen R. Bissett, uh was reading to, from it to me. And... Um, and this this tale about um, um, uh, Jesus is this uh, kind of juvenile delinquent or something, and of course you know there's, there's but the point is right. I mean even if you know these the, these books are apocryphal right, and and there the existence of books that talk about Jesus being you know a, a bad kid or a naughty guy, you know aren't aren't the kind of things that you use to sort of throw cold water on Christian beliefs right. I mean it's True. just more it's 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 just more amusing confusion added to. Uh, <laughs> To, to a situation, but um, it does, I think, tie into this whole question of, well, what can you take seriously from back then? Um, because it does seem as if there is a startling lack of secular documents, just plain old historical documents from that mm. period where, you know, somebody just say, you know, hey, Jesus came to town today and did all this stuff and then he left and, and, and that's the end of it. Um, so that is where I think that, you know, you really need to be looking for, you know, any indications that Jesus may have been a, a, a true historical figure. Uh, granted, I agree. Uh, the last thing is uh, just kind of continuing what I was saying about the, the idea of uh, hell used as a threat, the whole oppressive atmosphere of religion, which is uh, an argument I don't have the reference right to hand, but um, in one of 
uh, the volumes of uh, Lovecraft's selected letters. Uh, what he found to be one of the most telling arguments about religion, which in general he supported because it gave people comfort and so on, uh, though he thoroughly disbelieved in it, um, Mm -hmm. was that it is inculcated at such an early age before children have the tools of logic and reason at their command. And uh, the fact that they feel that they have to inculcate it at such an early age is almost damning in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, because if, if they're able to reason, if they're able to, to argue about points and, and ask questions that need to be answered, um, science allows that. Anything that has a basis in reality allows that, because it allows you to grow, to learn, to compare, uh, whereas religion simply doesn't. And the fact that they don't allow that, and that, in fact, it's, it's frowned upon to ask such questions ties right into that, as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, I, and I, I think it's kind of funny, a lot of the fundamentalist Christians, they've been doing this since the 60s and the 70s, are making statements like, parents, watch out, homosexuals across America are out to get your children. Yeah, I think that they're practicing a little psychological projection <laughs> here, and they're out to get the children. Yeah. You know, uh, and I, yeah, I think that you're correct on that. I also find it very interesting that a phrase that used to be very common in in Christian circles has fallen out of political favor. I think, um, and that is, it used to be that you were not only a God loving but a God fearing right. person. God fearing right. person. Yeah, and which is why that, they wouldn't allow atheists, and, and they still don't in some states, on juries. Because if you don't have a fear of eternal punishment, how can you be trusted to tell the truth on the stand? Yes. Uh, you know, which is ludicrous. Which, which, well, which shows a very low regard for human dignity. Yeah. Which, I well, and I think that's endemic to, to the Christian belief system, is that uh, when, you, when you peel away all the layers, what you get is, is this very misanthropic belief system that says essentially people are bad and there's no way that they cannot be bad. You know, the best thing that they can possibly do is join this faith at which point they'll still be bad, but at least they'll be forgiven for their badness. And, um, and then, you know, just keep praying and asking for forgiveness for your badness, and that makes you not necessarily good, because only, you know, God and Jesus can be the morally, truly, you know, morally perfect figures, but you'll be at least a little bit less bad, and you'll be forgiven for your badness, whereas everyone else is not. You know, I, I find that sort of thing very reprehensible. Well, I will not keep any longer, so you can get to your next caller, but thanks again. And, yeah, thank you. Uh, enjoy the program. Yes, well, thanks, and it's uh, always good to hear from you, and um, we'll talk to you real soon. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, some good uh, references there. Um, uh, he's, he's, a, he's always our little renaissance man. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've actually met him, and he's a really good guy. Uh, just take a brief uh, you know, breather out here, folks, just, just to remind uh, all of our unbelievers uh, at home in the peanut gallery that uh, we do have our uh, Sunday morning 10.30 a.m. bagel shop meetings. If you're an atheist and looking to meet other atheists and hang out and have a good time, well, come on down. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, just a fun social gathering um, uh, for unbelievers only on Sunday mornings. Although next week, we will be at Furs Cafeteria in the Longhorn Room in the back at North Cross Mall. So please don't go next Sunday to uh, the bagel shop. Uh, Peter is on line three. Let's see what Peter has to say about all this. Hello, Peter. Howdy. Hey, you're on the air. What's going on? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just thinking about some of the stuff Lazarus said, and uh, it's something I hear a lot from different Christians that, I guess like to feel like they're more scientifically oriented or whatever, and they they explain God as the Big Bang or the the cause for it and stuff. And mm-hmm. I just I feel like it's it's more exciting and powerful and empowering if you look at it as a, a chance or just a kind of unguided happening. You know, it, to think that that blindly we found our way to where we are. Well, um... and. Well, I think that the, you know, the, the idea that people can come up with really great ideas and can figure their way around situations and learn things, that, that we are a learning species, mm-hmm. um, says a lot about us. And I think that, yeah, that is a very exciting thing to know. Um, I have often, in, not only on this program listening to some callers, but in some email exchanges that, exchanges that, I'm had, that I've had, 
with some Christians, been astonished to to uh, view the virulent, almost, contempt that they have for this whole idea that human beings could possibly imagine that we could do anything on our own without help. You know, how foolish is that? No, you know, that we could just blindly stumble along our way. You know, what a stupid thing for us puny humans to think. There is running through, now, now granted, this is, you know, again, these people are probably more intensely fundamentalist than your average, you know, Joe everyday Christian, but I am I never cease to be astonished by this loathing of people that seems to be endemic to their belief system. Well, even an everyday go lucky Christian that believes in evolution seems to believe that they have this tie to the source of light and knowledge and love and the universe or something and mm-hmm. that that only they have by believing what they believe. And, and if that were true, it just seems like the evidence would be overwhelming. Like, they would be the only people with money. And they would be, <laughs> the only people who would be sick would be, you know, the, yeah. the people who believe in the other religions or, you know, stuff like that. And, yeah. Well, and, and, and all these miracles happen before photography or, you know. And, mm-hmm. like that, you know? Yeah, well, where, but, yeah. Where were the news cameras? Well, then, yeah. You know. um, yeah, it kind of interesting. One thing, it's, it's interesting what you, you brought up. One, I think my first little inklings of skepticism that I was experiencing as a child, right, was, you know, I would read all these Bible stories when I'm going to Sunday school, right? And when you're a little child, you get the you know, Bible stories in children's book form, right? So they're... The, you know, so these, yeah, the, the children's Bible with the cartoon drawings. Kind of, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and it's one story after another story after another story of people having these overt supernatural experiences with angels and... All over Jesus, the place. And God himself, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like peering through... I mean, I even like... Uh, you know, there, even the, the, the most cliché drawing ideas you could imagine, where, you know, someone like, like Moses, and then there's this cloud, right, with a hand poking, <laughs> like, do this now. And I'm like, gee whiz, you know, all the, you know, God seems to be, and the angels, and they seem to just be... Everywhere. Really, you know, I mean, I, I'm too young to, you know, formulate the words, but I was thinking, you know, they were really proactive back then, right? I mean, they were on the job, and you saw them all over the place, and, and it's like, and it's funny that I don't see... You know, people or beings or big pointy fingers coming yeah. out of like, why don't I see, you know, fingers? When I have a, a, a problem and I don't understand how to deal with it, you know, why don't I see a big uh, finger coming out of the sky and a booming voice telling me, well, Martin, do well, this. Well, yes, and, and all will be well. <laughs> yeah, and, and so that was, that was what was interesting to me, you know, and, and you, you kind of you brought that point. Of the, that was the, I think that's my first little inkling of a skeptical thought when I was a little boy. Like and there's a, uh, and I, now I, I don't know the person that, that actually said it, but there's a quote that says something to the effect of where uh, science has flourished, miracles have ceased. Uh, in the countries where science has really uh, taken hold, uh, mer- the, the rate of miracles seems to drop, uh, you know, precipitously. Well, it hasn't uh, worked with those urine-drinking guys in India. But, yes, uh, well, that's true, yeah. that's true. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see what's up with that. But, uh, yeah, um, anything else for us? No. Hey, man. Well, hey, it's great that you're watching. We appreciate it. And, and thanks for your call. You made some really good, you know, funny points. All right. Thank you. Like, so uh, call back anytime. I will. Take care, man. All right. Later. That was Peter, wasn't it? Yes, on okay. three. Okay. Cool. Well, let's see. We have my, the calls just keep coming. We're down to our last 15 minutes, folks. If you want to talk to us, please get those calls in right away. The number two call is 477 I do believe. And we have Mike on one. Let's see what he has to allow. Mike. Yes. Uh, Hi, you're on the air. How you doing? I wanted to comment. You guys were talking about the uh, Book of Thomas, and uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's one of the ones that was not included in the original canon. Well, I, I guess all I was going to point out is, and not necessarily you, but I hear a lot of people it, talk about when they talk about books that are not in the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's like they believe those, but they won't believe the ones in the Bible, and you can't logically you can't do it both ways. Well, of course it both not. Ways. No, definitely not. And, and that's the only point I wanted to make is that if you're going to go around talking about the Book of Thomas as true, yeah. then you also got to look at the. You can't. You can't just be making this what you're going to believe. Pull out what you want to also. Sure. So. Well, I, I I hope that I didn't uh, give the impression that I thought that maybe books that weren't included in the in, included in the Bible would have any more truth than ones that were. Um, if, if I made that point, then uh, please, for goodness' sake, let me correct it. Um, I just meant to say that. It, it is the, this is one of the factors that exist that make it very, very difficult for historians to know what can possibly be a reliable, historically accurate document about 
whether or not a person named Jesus actually existed in Judea at that time and did stuff and what exactly was it that he did. That was really the only point I, I, I was trying to make is that there, even 1800 years ago, 1900 years ago, there was a lot of uh, active debate over, well, which of these can we trust? And it still goes on today. Sure. That's the only point that I was trying to make. And, so. and, I, and I agree with that. But yeah. then, you know, and you also got to look at other things, too. And, and one of the things I don't see you guys looking at is on looking at if, if these were true is like the apostles' lives that were changed. And I mean, it's very well documented that Peter was crucified upside down uh, mm -hmm. in other places. What went on with this guy that he went through this change of uh, Christ didn't really resurrect from the grave? And I mean, there's. Well, sure, but again, you can. Uh a person's intensity of belief, as admirable or creepy as it may be, d is not a thing that in and of itself you can point to and say, well, this is evidence that there are supernatural events going on. Right. Remember, in, in World War II Japan, there were guys, you know, kamikaze pilots willing to blow themselves up and crash their planes because of their intensity in, of belief in their emperor and Japan's cause in the war. So... Um, and, and they're I don't, also yeah. even. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, I'm sorry. Uh, even ahead. present day, there are people that are are willing today to stake their life earnings and life savings and even their lives on uh, psychics, faith healers, uh, or, you know, uh, and things like that. And then these people, of course, they go and die, or they get their bank account wiped out, and they're making these really big steps. And they're doing it, even though this person may later prove to be a fraud. Uh, they are giving everything because they believe, uh, and that, that belief doesn't show that this person is is true, yeah. you know, that, or that what they can do is is uh, yeah. No, supernatural. We, yeah, we don't deny that Christianity has changed many many people's lives, um, and has given people a, a a focus and a thing to believe in about which they can be really devout. But again, that again, intensity of belief is you know Aquinas tried to make that argument, but it, it, intensity of belief alone, while it may be either admirable on the one hand or kind of scary on the other hand, um, is not in and of itself something that you can really look at and say, okay, well, that's evidence. Well, it's not really evidence. The only thing it's evidence of is that there's this guy and he believes this stuff very, very devoutly. But, but then, you know, on, on the other hand, like I'm hearing you guys laugh about things that have happened uh, that Christians do, and I, I admit there's some freaked out Christians out there, no doubt, but there's also some very freaked out atheists out there. I mean, we've seen it in communism. You know, mm -hmm. how many people died under communism? Yeah, but again, you know, it, communism but, well, is not... Hold on a second, but it's nowhere near the number that have died at the hands of the church. Uh, sure, uh, but again, got, of course, you know, communism is not really a thing that I think you'll find too many American atheists uh, supportive of. I mean, communism was an economic theory that sure, was but, not a good economic theory. You know, the Just, argument kind of comes up, well, how can yeah. I believe in, in this God of this and that? Well, how can I believe in this atheism where... I mean, and that is, well, you know, it, it's still going on in China today. Well, you know, yeah, but I mean, remember, communism is, a, is an economic theory, and it doesn't really have to do with questions of, it, it's not necessarily an atheist thing, okay? I actually, mean, you can, actually, it is, so, because one of the things that we're going to do uh, in communism is they're going to create uh, the Garden of Eden here, you know, I forget the term off the top of my head, but if... Is essentially the Garden of Eden again. Trying to create utopia here on earth exactly, through their communist. Yeah. But actually, in the in the Bible, Jesus presented quite a few communistic. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the, well, a, a, a rich man cannot enter the kingdom. Sell of all you have, give it to the poor. You know, take yeah. care of everybody around you. That, that, it's easier for, uh, for you to a ride a camel right through the eye of a needle than it is to. Right. Yeah, but the point is, okay. I mean, the we, the, uh, the 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 whole guilt by association trip with communism and atheism is not really. Uh, well, no, but I mean. Other people do that to, to Christianity, right. and, and whether or not, well, you know, just because the Catholic Church did something bad, does that mean that God, religion, I, I can agree with you that I don't believe in certain religions, but does that mean that God is not true? And well, I no, that's no. no, we don't use, no. when we point out things that people in the church have done that we consider to be objectionable or reprehensible or bad or what have you, we're not using that as a, an argument for there, you see, this means God doesn't exist. When we point those things out, what we are doing is refuting a claim that we hear uh, almost nonstop, that, uh, it is, that it is only through theism or belief in a deity that a person can have a, a, a moral basis to their life. And clearly that isn't true. You know, being a Christian or being a theist doesn't make you a better person just automatically. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen. If it did, we wouldn't have these reports of, 
you know, got, you know, pe- religious people committing fraud in the church or, you know, priests, you know, engaging in sexual molestation and what have you. We wouldn't see those reports, but we're constantly being told that, you know, atheists can't be moral because if you don't believe there's a God up there punishing sinners, then you don't have any basis for morality. And we, you know, and we, and so we use those events to refute that argument. Um, but anyway, but you're right. I mean, there can be fanatics in every sort of group. But what we try to do on this show is if we are critiquing the belief system, we'll critique the belief system. And if we are critiquing an individual, it will be because of something that that individual did. And, and we, we don't try to do this sort of bait and switch where we say, oh, well, you know, this guy has bad hair and wears blue suits. So God doesn't exist. So that must mean that, yeah, <laughs> God doesn't exist. No, that's not, uh, that's not what it's all about at all. But anyway, we're down to our last 10 minutes. If God did exist, he would be a much snappier dresser snappier, than that. Yeah. So anyway, we need to uh, get uh, into our next caller uh, right uh, in our last 10 minutes. So thanks very much for you. your call. Talk to you later. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, Russell pointed out in this uh, whole this discussion that when people try to bring up the big bugaboo of communism and attach it to what they're what they what they are Stalinism, mm-hmm. which was the situation of you know you had this guy Joe Stalin right who then rose to power in Russia and and you know he was and he was far more interested in his own sort of absolute power and dictatorship and you know um, and the suppression of the church under Stalin was this whole thing of just, you know, he didn't want any other influences out there, you know, I and mean, he wanted to be God. Right. You know, and so it was, it was sort of a, but, it, but again, that's a whole blank, I mean, uh, uh, you know, communism and atheism, you're right, it's, as he pointed out, is just, is, you can't use communism to condemn atheism any more than you can use the fact that priests molest kids as your proof that there is no God. They're two entirely different subjects. And I don't know a single atheist who thinks communism is the least bit rational. I certainly don't. Uh, let's go to uh, oh, Jeff D on line three. See what he has to say. Uh, Jeff. Hey guys. Hey, what's going on? Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the call. Sure. Uh, I, I I missed the last caller's name, but he said a couple of things that I wanted to comment on. Okay, sure. Uh, first, he said something to the effect of, "Well, you know, you you ask how can people believe in this religion, but." You know, you could, people could also ask, how can I believe in this atheism? I was going to make a point well, on that, but I thought, but I'll let you Atheism know is not a thing, thing you to believe be in. believed in. No. Atheism isn't a be- belief. Atheism is a- just belief. Atheism is just a word to describe, uh, uh, atheist is just a word to describe a person who doesn't believe that there's a God. Right. That's all it is. Yeah. There's nothing else to it. Right. Yeah, I was going to point that out, but I wanted to. I thought it was more important to address his whole. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. He yeah. was he was all over the place. Right. Uh, and then another thing that he said that was awfully kooky was, <laughs> uh, you denied that there was a necessary link between atheism and communism, and he says, "Oh no, because communists were trying to create Eden." Yeah. Now, yeah, how does that follow? I, it well, doesn't. What, I, I, when I, is atheism about yeah. trying to create Eden? I mean, uh, yeah, that, I don't know. I don't. I can't that, explain it. I, there's like no. <laughs> I, I can't even put that concept together. It's like, um, uh, if anything, that would be proof that communism was Christianity, <laughs> right? <laughs> because well, atheists don't believe in Eden. Yeah. Plus, it's a it's a weird kind of criticism of communism because it wasn't Eden supposed to be a good place and <laughs> yes. trying yeah. to make a, the, that place be a good thing yeah. I mean all uh, all philosophical approaches to life mm-hmm. ultimately have as their goal improving things right and so you know how how that can be twisted into they were trying to improve things, therefore they were bad and hence atheist. I, I the guy completely lost me. Yeah, and of course this whole idea that uh, these people who were atheists were trying to recreate, uh, you know, religious myths in yeah, the world. Yeah, a, a, a mythical land from somebody else's yeah. uh, fairy tales. Very very bizarre. Well, yeah. I, I just I, I think he didn't quite know where he was going, but I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to steer him a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the. I've, but I've, I've, the main point was the whole the, the question of well the disciples had their lives changed and it's sort of like again you know uh, you know Thomas Aquinas tried to make this argument about the soldier of faith I think he used it and again 
you know, um, intensity of belief is intensity of belief, but, you know, you, uh, you cannot use that as proof of the veracity of a supernatural claim. I right. mean, you could have a lunatic believing, you know, with powerful devotion that uh, he has an invisible magic elf sitting on his head. All right. And, you know, okay, or, he believes or, that. Or a get into heaven free ticket as a result of flying an airplane into a skyscraper. To, uh, to a skyscraper, you know, right, where he'll have 72 virgins. The fact that there are people willing to give their lives for beliefs that Christians clearly don't agree with. Sure. Right? So the ability to give your life for a belief is not proof that the belief is true. Yeah. If it was, then we'd have to believe everything that anybody was willing to give their life for. And clearly, some of the things people are willing to give their lives for are just ludicrous. Yeah, pretty stupid stuff. All right, yeah, anyway, go, yeah. go on to the next call. I don't want to. Wait a second before you go. Is Amanda? Yeah, oh, that's going right. to be at Furs. Is yes. she talking at Furs? Yes, Amanda will be doing the lecture at uh, at Furs next Sunday. On. Uh, we don't have a subject yet. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll just wing it. We'll come <laughs> right. through. It'll be on random chance. That's <laughs> it. Well, you know, her last one was uh, was on. Uh, 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 health and uh, recent medical discoveries yes. and tying a whole bunch of interesting new um, uh, uh, biomedical discoveries together in an interesting way. And so I, I expect whatever she comes up with will be great. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Sure will. All right, All right. and that'll be next Sunday at first. Yeah. All right, Jeff, you take Thanks care. Thanks for call. Bye, guys. Okay, and we'll go to our you, last fellow. Who you just hung up on. Oh, who am I just hung up on? Well, I'll go to the person on Oopsie. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that was not... Oh, I've done that before, haven't I? All right, well, our last caller then will be the person who is holding on line one, uh, whose name I don't know yet. Um, is there someone holding on one? Yeah. Let's, let's check and see. Do we have someone on one? I had a blinking red light. No one. No one. Okay. okay. Uh, phone lines are free, so let's then uh, calls are shut down then for today. We, we hung up the on guy, Don. Unless Don calls back immediately and we'll put you on the air for, this for a few minutes to get, get your yeah, question or I'm comment. I'm very sorry about that. Just uh, fucking hit the wrong goddamn button. It's happened before. Okay. Um... So let's see. Uh, I'll just uh, wrap up the program here in the last couple minutes that we have. Maybe this is him calling right now. Is this Don um, on one? We have on our website at atheist-community.org a links page, which I have, um, which has a quite a few dead links, and I've tried to remind Russell about that, but I don't think he's responded to it yet. But anyway, one of the live links <laughs> that jab, is good. Jab, jab. Yeah, little little <laughs> reminder poke there. One of the live links that we have is to a site called Ask the Astronomer, and if you have co- Big Bang cosmology questions or origins of the universe questions, well, there are around 3,000 of them on this site. And um, I was going to read from one of them about uh, observational facts supporting Big Bang Theory, Don's but we don't have time. So we're going to go ahead and talk to Don on line two in the last three minutes of the show. Hey, Don. How are you doing? Tom? Hey, sorry about that. Uh, that's all right. Okay, uh, what's, uh, what do you have for us? We only have a couple of minutes well, left. I understand that. Uh, I wanted to ask you, this uh, faith is not proof that there is a God, and you, your faith is, a, is an atheist. You no, I don't have faith as an atheist. <coughs> Atheism, you said that atheism the, is the atheism is a belief that there no, is no God. No, atheism is disbelief in gods. Okay, this is this. I think we've heard from you before. Um, atheism is disbelief, and you cannot say that disbelief and belief are the same thing. Well, I was right? commenting on you, the man that was before me said mm-hmm. that atheism was a faith that there is no God. No, so he did not say that. You did he, not agree with him. No, no, no. We don't agree with that. Okay. Atheism, okay. atheism is a faith. No. Uh, and he did not to, say atheism was a faith that there is no God. He would He said it's a, it's a belief that there is no God. No. Atheism is the lack of belief in any gods or supernatural deities. So don't you believe conversely that there is no God? If no. it's a lack of belief in God, then it's the belief that there is no God. Now, see, you're playing the definitions game. Here's, here's disbelief and belief are opposites, okay? They're not the same thing. It's like, do you believe in leprechauns? Do I believe? Do you no, I believe, believe that there are no leprechauns? Do you believe in leprechauns? I believe that there are no leprechauns. But uh, do you, can you prove that, though? Can you? Yeah, I cannot prove it. Yeah, well, Nor well, can you prove there's no God. But you, so it it makes less sense to prove that to be, to believe that there are no leprechauns than it does to simply not believe that there are any. If you believe that there are no leprechauns, then you should have evidence that there are no leprechauns. But you cannot have that sort of evidence because you don't go around proving negatives. That's not how things work. The most sensible thing to say is, I don't believe that there are any leprechauns. 
And until I get evidence for a God, I'm going to say I don't believe that there is a God. I do not believe that there is no God because clearly I think that there are things in the world that people refer to as gods. If, if you had a primitive tribesman with his little statue of his God on a pedestal and he worshipped that, I would have to believe that that God was his God. I would disagree with him that it was an actual supernatural entity perhaps. I would not believe that. But it does not make sense to say you believe something unless you have evidence for it. But if you don't have evidence for it, not believing in it is the same thing as firmly believing against it. Can I make a quick comment? No, we don't have time. I'm sorry. We don't. We're out of time. We're down to thirty seconds. Okay, but it's a common misunderstanding. Call back next week. Please check our. Please check our fact page on that question. Okay, Uh, believing in something and not believing in something aren't the same thing. They're opposites of things. And not believing in something is not the same thing as believing that that thing cannot possibly exist. All right, but we can. You're getting all intellectual. Yeah. Man. No. Well, it's their right. their distinctions. Bye bye.